Okay, hi there and uh, welcome to a revision video where we're going to spend a few minutes looking at some of the arguments for and against government support for the banking sector when there's a financial crisis. Are government bailouts for financial organisations such as banks justified? This image comes from Greece, a country that's been beset with financial crises over the last decade and more. It comes from 2015 in uh, Thessaloniki uh, where pensioners were spotted queuing outside a bank. Uh, banks had only opened for the retired to allow them to cash up to, I think, 120 euros in Athens. Financial instability, the threat to savings, the threat to the trust in the system is absolutely crucial to this whole debate. Now, in the UK, uh, we go back just over a decade where the UK government, under the then Chancellor Alastair Darling and Prime Minister Gordon Brown, took the decision to launch a multi-billion pound bailout of parts of the UK financial system during the global financial crisis, which reached, I suppose, a, an epigee, a peak in the autumn of 2008 with the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers in the United States. Here are four examples of commercial banks that were given a financial lifeline. Uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, Lloyds, Northern Rock, I was a shareholder, and Bradford and Bingley. Although not every bank required a bailout, for example, Barclays was able to survive without a bailout, although it was later to become mired and embroiled in controversies of its own. In total, the UK government spent upwards of £135 billion pounds on the bailouts. The net spend, once the shares have been resold, uh, is, is, is estimated to be about £23 billion. Pounds. So what are the main arguments in support, in favour of a national government deciding to, to bail out commercial banks who are making heavy losses. A bailout is any basic form of financial support. Typically, the government might inject some fresh equity into the business or cover some of the losses. It's basically a form of financial support. Well, here are five arguments. First of all, uh, if banks collapse, uh, then there could be significant negative multiplier effects, particularly if thousands of well-paid banking jobs and related services are lost. So there was the fear that a banking collapse could make the recession deeper. Uh, there could be externalities from a banking collapse. It could squeeze the, the lending, squeeze, reduce the amount of credit available to small and medium-sized businesses, for example, who need to borrow money perhaps to stay in business or to finance investment to expand. A wider issue affecting potentially millions of people is that savers, people with deposits in the banking system, and pensioners, people with money in pension funds, much of which was invested in banks, well, they're at risk if the commercial banks fail. And if savers and pensioners suffer, uh, this might worsen poverty and then could lead to increased pressure on the government to offer more in welfare payments. The wider issue, I suppose, is that uh, the collapse of a bank, if it was allowed to continue, would lead to a severe decline in confidence, so-called Keynesian animal spirits, a loss of trust in the financial system, which is so important that would risk turning a recession into a deep deflationary depression. And the, the, bailout, uh, the bailouts that came along in 2008, 2009 were, were predicated largely on that fear that the financial crisis could lead to a 1930s style deflation depression. Uh, a counter argument, sorry, well, a related argument is that the money you spend on the bailouts in the immediate period uh, that can be recouped gradually as the economy recovers. So, for example, the banks might start making a profit again. If you've got a stakeholding in that, that the government stands to benefit. Or the government could start reselling shares as companies and banks recover. So the net cost of the bailout, key concept, net cost of the bailout, is probably going to be much smaller as the government unwinds it. Uh, I suppose the biggest single justification is the concept of systemic risk. This is a tremendously important concept, great to put in uh, A-style answers. So systemic risk is the possibility that an event at the micro level, the failure, for example, of an individual bank or pension fund or insurance company, that could have a much wider externality and perhaps trigger instability or the collapse of an entire industry or economy. And the global financial crisis certainly illustrated to us just how interconnected the financial world has become. Uh, an event, a shock in one location, 
United States can have a much bigger effect on the stability of institutions and markets across the world. So the bailout was essentially a response to the fears of the macro consequences of systemic risk. However, of course, you need to evaluate. So what are some of the arguments for not bailing out banks at times of crisis? Well, the first argument is that the bailout is expensive. It's multi-billion pounds. Those bailouts will increase government borrowing and the national debt, particularly if the government takes on board some of the debts of the loss-making banks. If government deficits go up and the debt goes up, that could lead to higher market interest rates and or higher taxes in the future, which could crowd out the private sector. The second point is that the money, the funds tied up in a bailout, and as we've seen, billions of pounds, well, that money has an opportunity cost. That money could have perhaps been used to invest in infrastructure or improved health and education services. The third argument is called the moral hazard point. This is the argument that if you bail out a commercial bank uh, for having taken extremely high risks in search of profit, if you bail them out, you're essentially insuring them against that, that risk and that might influence their behaviour in the future, perhaps um, taking them, causing them to take even bigger risks going forward. There are also equity issues. Why should taxpayers, many of whom didn't cause the financial crisis, why should they pay the price for a bailout in terms of higher taxes? If the government's bailing out banks, is it equitable that they choose not to bail out a steelworks or an airline or a travel company like Thomas Cook or a loss-making retailer? Why, why are the banks singled out for, for special treatment? The Austrian school, uh, economists such as Hayek and Schumpeter, well, the Austrian school argue, of course, that the government should not be bailing out financial institutions, that allowing loss-making banks to fail is just part of the normal wider process of capitalism and eventually new banks will take their place, challenger banks perhaps with less risky, more innovative business models. Okay, so those are five arguments. I think the key argument is probably moral hazard. So moral hazard, you may have come across this when you've studied market failure. Uh, this happens when an agent, in this case a bank, is given an implicit guarantee of support by the government in the event of, event of making a big loss. A bailout is a good example of this. And if you are insured against loss, that can cause the agent to change their behaviour and take more risk, knowing that they have their insurance policy in the back of their hand. The profits they make are privatised. They go to their shareholders. The losses are socialised if the government nationalises and bails the business out. Well, a bit of extra context to help you get that A star. Um, I think the case for bailout is obviously contextual. It depends on, for example, the significance of the financial sector to the to any country, to an, an economy. Uh, the city of London, we know, is huge. It's important. Uh, what risk is there of a bigger, wider risk of capital flight out of stock markets and bond markets? Uh, banking provides a major source of exports um, and related financial services. Uh, banks, until the crisis, were making big profits, source of tax revenues for the government. In the UK and the United States, they chose the bailout approach. Lehman Brothers was allowed to go bust, but basically they chose to bail out institutions and nationalise. What they've done in, in its wake and in its place is to bring in tests and measures to, to force banks to increase their capital reserves and to become more resilient at times of stress. In fact, bailouts have now largely been replaced by bail-ins. You probably have may have come across this concept, a bail-in is where the government says, or the central bank says to a commercial bank, you have to issue new bonds to people who are prepared to lend to a bank. Now those bonds, that's debt, but they're converted into capital equity if a bank's losses wipe out their capital reserves. In other words, if banks making huge losses, any commercial bank issued bonds are converted into shares, so ultimately the shareholder will lose their money if the bank behaves irresponsibly. Iceland chose a different approach. There are three leading banks. Uh, Landis Banky was one. Uh, they basically nationalised them and then liquidated those banks, created some new banks. So essentially they followed the Austrian approach. Um, this came at a severe economic cost in terms of exchange rates and recession and inflation. But they do appear to have emerged from that process in, you know, in relatively good health in recent times.
And of course, you don't necessarily have to bail out banks. Um, you could, but you might bring in tougher rules on lending, for example. You're not allowed to lend out as much for new mortgages. Or you could open the, the market to new challenger banks, supply side reforms designed to make the banking system more contestable and challenge the monopoly power of those big established lenders. Uh, finally, a slide showing what's happened to Royal Bank of Scotland. This is in many ways the poster child of the bailout issue. You can see what happened to their share price during the period from the early 1990s all the way through to in the mid part of the last decade or the, the, the noughties. Share price, if you're an RBS shareholder, you're doing pretty well. Ups and downs, of course, but look at that. The share price was climbing towards £70 per share. And then the crisis hit. The bank had way overextended itself, losses mounted, the share price collapsed and the government nationalised the bank, took a controlling stake and um, uh, the rest is history. Well, the bank continued to make heavy losses for several years. I think they made a profit in 2016 or 2017. The government has started to sell some of the shares, but it's never sold the shares at a price above what they paid. Let's say they paid £5 per share. Well, they're selling their shares at £3.30, £3.50, £3.70 per share. So they're realising some losses, but they are gradually unwinding the bailout and returning the Royal Bank of Scotland, which is now a much smaller bank, back to the private sector. They're trying to sell about £3 billion worth of stock every year until 2023, in which case the last shares will be sold in about five years' time, nearly two decades on from the bailout. The overall cost of the bailout is it, it's about £27 billion. Pounds. Now that raises an interesting question, is that justified given that uh, what would be the economic consequences of allowing banks such as the Royal Bank of Scotland to fail? So this is an important issue. It brings in lots of macroeconomic issues and questions and it's a good one to practice your evaluation skills on.